back, relax, grab a coffee, some popcorn. This one is going to be interesting. Hello and welcome to episode six of Behind the Politics. I am your host, Ben Krause. Today I'm joined by Sock Dem or Chris. How are you doing today, Chris? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you doing today, Ben? I'm doing great. Um, I'm having some some work problems with Chili's. Uh, we won't go into it a lot, but it, it, yeah, we just won't go into it. I'm I'm currently looking for a new job, so if any of you guys have any um any requests, Chris, you have any requests? I don't have any requests. Is it is it a problem with introductions where you have to say "Welcome to Chili's"? Did they change that? <laughs> What's your no no no? no. <laughs> but uh, if if you guys are new to the podcast, what we do here is we well actually. We changed the podcast a little bit. So if you're new here, you're kind of listening to a different podcast than everybody else listened to. Uh, what we used to do was we had uh, a weekly briefing of COVID election, international news, and uh, and some political TikTok news. But now we're shifting that to our Instagram page. And that's watch, at Watch Verbum on Instagram. So we have a nice little uh, thing put together with all the, uh, the weekly briefing news. So really, really cool gig. Um, Go check it out on the Instagram. And uh, but we will still be having a story of the week this week, of course, is the election and kind of the, uh, the debate that happened. And this week we don't have an, uh, an interview, but we will be having interviews in the future. So I say we just get right into it. Uh, how, how did you like this debate compared to the last one? Yeah, I watched both of the debates. I thought that this one was a lot better, a lot less frustrating. Um, I think that this just more so went along the lines of um, common partisan disagreements between the candidates. And for that reason, I thought I thought Trump did slightly better, but I also think Biden did better. In the end, I think it was kind of a wash on who, quote unquote, won the debate. And also considering that tens of millions of people have already voted, this would have a lesser impact than the first debate did. But yeah, yeah, I definitely think it was a much better debate. I I, I still don't think it was like crazy impressive of a debate like i've seen better debates on political tiktok but um definitely definitely a huge step up from uh from the last debate and yeah i I guess we can go straight into like some of like the nitty-gritty about it i'd like to start on healthcare because this is something that i've been watching with trump specifically for a while is that trump is still trying to create this healthcare plan like he's been saying that he's going to have this healthcare plan since he got in office, and he hasn't. And 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 now Biden's introducing this new uh, Biden care plan with a Obamacare with a public option. Mm. Uh, really interesting. But Trump, come on, dude, you've had four years. Where's your healthcare plan? Yeah, I think the <laughs> interesting thing about it is that he could literally just go off of. I think it's called like the American Health Security Act or something like that. And it was introduced when they were repealing Obamacare in like 2017. And he literally just could have gone off of that and said, this is my health care plan. This is what I want to get through because they didn't get it through when they had the House and the Senate. So I don't know if it's like he didn't think that was comprehensive enough. So he wanted to drop it if he thought that it was unpopular. So he wanted to drop it or that he failed the first time around. So he's not persistent enough to want to go forward. But yeah, I don't really understand that. I mean. I think what I would have said if I was Trump was some is something along the lines of the government doesn't have to have a plan for everything. The market can help things and get things through. Other uh, civil society, charity, individuals can make decisions themselves. It doesn't have to just be the government. And I think that might make a lot more sense rather than just saying, I have a plan, but you don't actually have a plan. So I don't really understand where he's going with that. Yeah, and, I, and like the only thing that he's really said, and I'm not quoting him, per se, but I, I'm pretty sure this is what he said. He said, like, I'd like to terminate Obamacare and come up with a brand new, beautiful health care. Come up with, like, like beautiful, like, better health care. But he hasn't given a plan for it. Like, he said this for the last four years. Like, I will have a health care plan. I'm making it. It's going to be great. It's this fantastic, uh, terrific health care plan. Uh, but he hasn't come up with one. And then, and then Biden, at least the per- first time that I heard about it, like really publicly about it, his Biden care thing with the Obamacare with the public option in, in this debate, he kind of set the foreground of what it was because what Trump's trying to do is send the Affordable Care Act to the uh, Supreme Court. We can talk about that a little bit also, but um, 
but yeah, what what are your thoughts on on Biden care? Like how he how he presented it? Yeah, so I've I personally had heard of it before because I was pretty involved with the with the primary battle and I voted in the primary and that was one of the big disagreements with Medicare for all versus the public option. I guess it's kind of unique that he hasn't called a Biden care before, but he's definitely talked about a public option before. Oh yeah. Yeah. He talks about reducing premiums and such. What I also think is interesting is it's weird because Trump has d- taken actions on healthcare in his administration, or he's at least promised to take specific actions on healthcare. Um, so, for example, I don't know if he passed this executive order or if he's just proposed it. There was one about international reference pricing for drugs, for drug pricing. Um, he's changed things with the FDA approval process to put out more generics, supposedly. There's been some other things. So I don't really understand why he doesn't just stick. If he can do, if he can take actions on those, I don't know why he can't take action on healthcare. I think it's just that he doesn't have a comprehensive plan in opposition to it. Um, but when it comes to what I think about Biden care, I think it's, I mean, definitely politically popular. The public option, however you phrase it, enjoys wide public support. And people just want to see, like, people just want to see a change in healthcare, whatever it is. And Trump saying, even Trump, even if Trump put out an idea for a bad plan, I think people might still prefer that than to have him having no plan because people have clearly been suffering clearly this year and through the pandemic, but also just for decades when it comes to having a lack of affordable and accessible health care. And Trump just not having a plan for it at all is a really bad political look for him, in my opinion. I I, I totally agree with him having a, a not great plan is better than having no plan i actually completely agree with that and like you said like he's done he's done things in regard to healthcare. why hasn't he just come out with a with a plan and like you said he might just not like i i just don't think he's one i don't think it's something that he truly actually cares about and two i just don't think he's confident in in making the decision of his healthcare plan yeah i mean one thing is that healthcare is not a flashy subject right like a yeah. lot of these other things that Trump wants to run on, like, oh, we've gotten so many jobs, we're bringing big things back from China. They're kind of more visible and obvious and things you can more easily brag on. Yeah, and, and he's made it like part of his his rhetoric yeah. is is using like he, he is he is the economy guy. Like in these debates, like he is the economy guy. So just kind of pushing his his healthcare, it's just not really his strong suit i'm not saying like he's not educated in it. i'm just saying like it's not necessarily his strong suit when it comes to like how the public sees him but uh and and that that's why i don't think it's on his top priority and yeah and even before um even before what he's done when he's been in office we just know that he's like been associated with being good with the economy because he's a businessman whether that's true or not. So I think the economy really fits into his public image. And even in some aspects, like foreign policies somewhat, because like he's like a bombastic, tough guy, people generally think, even if they don't always trust him on foreign policy, those two things really fit into his persona a lot more than healthcare, which Democrats have consistently pulled better on always that's one of the main reasons that they did so well in the 2018 elections and i think it's partly because obviously like people prefer their proposals but it's partly also because trump and the republicans have con- kind of ran on this bam- bombastic business tough businessman and that's not really a thing that you can put over to healthcare healthcare is kind of a you want a caring knowledgeable like technocrat kind of and that's kind of the image that democrats have actually been filling so i think that's one of the reasons that Trump has shied away from talking about healthcare so much and why the Democrats have succeeded on that front. Yeah, and, and I totally agree with that. But I, I would like to shift because you kind of brought in, I, I, I kind of, I picked it apart in my mind, but we kind of went, it, it's kind of a shifter into something else I'd like to talk about, which was, um, first off, Biden talking about Trump having uh, bank accounts in China, stuff like that, uh, the whole Hunter Biden thing and like the tax returns. Um, I guess I'll start with the tax returns. 
Trump Trump has been, and we saw this in 2016 debates. He he keeps saying that his his taxes are under audit, and that he won't release them until they're done. The audit. Uh, it, it's been four years. An, an average audit, I'm pretty sure, takes a year, and they have three years to do it once once you have an audit. So if if he was lying the first time about them actually being under audit, like that makes sense. But if they actually started to be under audit when he went into that debate, uh, they, they'd be done by now. But I, I don't see the whole thing why he like, do, do you think he he wants to release his tax returns? Yeah, I mean, he definitely doesn't want to release his tax returns. Everyone knows at this point, the only people that think the only people that think that he's actually under audit are people who are so far deep that they're not going to be convinced by anything else. Something that I find is that I find interesting when it comes to kind of this corruption question is that this is something that's really, I find very hard to gauge when it comes to polling. Because so, for example, I was just looking at um, the Pew Research Center top issues survey and like corruption is nowhere on that. It's like the economy, healthcare, Supreme Court, coronavirus, like the kinds of things you would expect. Right. And it's just so hard to gauge how how much people actually care about corruption because people can say they care about corruption. People might not care about corruption in regards to a particular issue. And I think if if I asked you or Alan or anyone else right now, like what issue do you care about the most when it comes to politics? It's like really hard for most people to say, especially people who aren't heavily invested in politics. But when it comes to this idea of like tax returns and trustworthiness, I think I've seen polls that voters find Biden actually more trustworthy than Trump, or it's not that far apart, at least. And in 2016, voters found uh, Trump to be much more trustworthy than Hillary Clinton, which is one of the reasons that he did so well. So I think that's a major blow to Trump. I don't really know what his tactic is now. With, when it comes to this stuff, I think they're try- just trying to make a spectacle out of this, throw it off however they can. Well, I, I, of, I think I think his yeah. tactic is just throwing it on to to Biden with the Hunter Biden situation, because that mm-hmm. that's really what he does. He just he says, oh, my taxes are under audit. And there's like, but what about this whole situation with you getting money from Russia, you, like all that stuff? And then yeah. then again, Biden's pushing this narrative that and whether we know this is true or not, we, we really don't know. But he keeps pushing the narrative that I, I first off, I'm pretty sure he says that like his son is did nothing wrong, which again, I'm not saying that he did or didn't, but um, yeah, he pushes that. Uh, and then again, we see another shift onto President Trump where he says, but then you have a bank account in, in China and all that, which I, I think is a, a stupid thing to go after because it's not like it's illegal to have bank accounts, like to have. Yeah. Stuff, especially because he did terminate it before he became a president. Mm. So I think that's a stupid thing to chase. But the whole whole Hunter Biden situation, Trump's shifting it onto Biden and tr- trying to get the light off his taxes. Um, that, that's pretty prominent. And we saw it in the debate. I guess so. I just don't know how much voters care about corruption. Unless they're I, yeah. one super invested. Well, no, I, I just don't think voters care about corruption when it comes to a particular candidate. Unless it unless they have a perception that's part of a of a broad trend when it comes to that candidate. So well, I think I, the reason that the corruption attacks worked against Hillary Clinton is because people already had a preconceived notion that she was super corrupt. But I don't think that was an idea that most Americans or even a plurality of Americans had with Joe Biden to begin with. So I just don't think this is going to stick. I think it could certainly increase in uh, voter enthusiasm for Trump's base. But I think just as much there could be an increase in enthusiasm for Biden's base because of um, all the information that came out about um, Trump's financial dealings from the New York Times. Something I thought was really interesting is, I don't know if you've heard like, this talking point that um, there's an enthusiasm gap between Trump and Biden, that Biden's voters are a lot less enthusiastic to vote for him than Trump's voters are to vote for him. 
Really? Well, something interesting I found is that this has actually been reversing and is about even um, in recent months and weeks. So I think maybe part of what Trump is trying to do is create that enthusiasm for him again that he was losing because he knows at this point in the race he's not winning back new voters. He's not winning new voters over. Oh he's no! Trying to put his face on more. Yeah, and then I, w- I would kind of go off your argument that uh, the general voter doesn't care about corruption. I would agree with that, but I would say the voter only cares about corruption if it's the other candidate that is corrupt, mm-hmm. because especially. Uh, at this stage in America, we have such a strong political divide that you you take anything like you see anything from the other side that you don't agree with or you think is like, for example, like corrupt. You're going to point that out and you're going to use that talking point for as long as you can before it's like debunked or it just like isn't a useful talking point anymore. So I, I would say especially. For some of the more, especially, I would say for, for the most part, I would say Trump supporters are more pro Trump than Biden supporters are pro. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, like the I, notion I'm trying to get off of. I definitely agree with that. I just think that there's not an enthusiasm gap, but I agree with your idea for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying it's gonna like shift the election or anything. I'm just saying like I, I think it's a little bit interesting. Yeah, and this whole thing about people only care about corruption when it comes to what the other party is doing is kind of a, just a natural consequence of partisanship and negative partisanship is a natural, um, is a natural outcome of partis excuse me, of partisanship. <laughs> because if you're a political party, the easiest thing to do is to smear your opponents, not encourage your own base, not actually do things differently. So in terms of political costs, if you have an incredibly partisan populace, the thing that's just naturally going to happen is negative partisanship. And that means that people don't care about corruption on their own side. And I don't know. And and I don't know how um, undecided voters really react to that. But I don't think undecided voters are are tuning into the debates, really. I think it's people. No, that. that, that, Yeah gonna win and they're like oh my gosh i need to i don't know i need to see how dumb biden looks i need to see how dumb trump looks yeah Yeah, no that's actually a solid take like i don't know how many undecided voters are actually taking these debates like seriously Mm -hmm. because they they know that it's not going to be a productive conversation like i don't I, i would have to see more more polling but i don't know how many people's decisions actually got swayed from being undecided from these debates but I would have to see, see some statistics. I mean, of course, some people are, but I'd have to see some like statistics on that. But um, what I've seen, it's very, very small. There's like yeah, barely. I, that that's what I would expect. Okay, so another thing I'd like to talk about, and I think this is something that not a lot of people are talking about, but I think they should, is Biden's push for an increase in the minimum wage during a pandemic. Trump attacked him for like. They, it was brought up by, uh, I don't know if it was brought up by the uh, moderator or if it wasn't, but Trump ended up attacking Biden, saying that the in- increasing the minimum wage is not the best thing for, um, for small businesses right now. And I think Biden said that it would like promote growth in small businesses. Um, I-, I don't know exactly what he said, but basically when asked on like the minimum wage topic, Trump basically said it should be a state option because... Like I said, Alabama is different from, from New York, and New York is different from Vermont. But um, and then Biden said that there should be an increase in them. Which, what, what do you think about an increase? Like, do you think that was good for him to say right now? Yeah, I don't really know if it was a good thing for him to say right now. But I also think that, and I'll get back to that in a second. But I also think that Trump's response was it made sense from like what the Republican playbook would expect us for it would like what he would be expected to say but it doesn't really make sense right like if you think that a minimum wage hike is bad for small businesses then there's no reason that you say we should just leave it up to the states like obviously you can't prohibit states from doing that but i think the the response the logical response 
if you think that the minimum wage hurts small businesses would be, yeah, we just shouldn't raise the minimum wage. I, mm-hmm. I, don't, see, I don't see how he thinks that those dynamics would really work any differently in any particular state. Like, obviously, like the equilibrium would be slightly different, but to a point of it being $15, and that would still hurt small businesses. So I don't really understand that. Um, and when it comes to small businesses, I just want to clarify that the moderator first asked about the minimum wage and if it's going to hurt um, uh, struggling small businesses. And Biden first said that we should be bailing them out when it comes to the PPP loans. And then he said, and, and he, that's, what, that's mostly what he said. He didn't seem to. Did he say that? Am I, okay, I need to check on this real quick. Okay, Biden I, said, I do because I think one of the things we're going to have to do now is we're going to have to bail them out. We should be bailing out small businesses. Blah, 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 blah. PPP. Help businesses as well as. Yeah, I don't. So I don't understand what Biden was really saying there. I, I don't either <laughs> because it, it seems like because it was like it's raising the minimum wage good ppp loans like that's not responsive at all yeah i don't think that was a good moment for biden really no and, not. Uh, i don't know if it's a good idea for him to i don't particularly know the economics of it i don't know if it's a good idea for him to want to raise the minimum wage i mean he, um, he, he was making yeah he was making more of like a a pathos argument of like the poverty line and mm-hmm. and like people that are I think it's like first responders deserve a minimum wage of fifteen dollars. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I definitely what people actually respond to, and Republicans do that on the same level, just with different things. Like yeah. they do that with uh, VA healthcare. Like if they mm-hmm. really believed in the value of privatized healthcare, then they wouldn't be like, "We're going to give um, VA healthcare to veterans." They would just be like. The veterans can find their own healthcare because the market would do it the best. So I think the mm-hmm. pathos works well on both on both ends. But yeah, that was I don't know if that's a good move for him to take. I think just Biden doesn't want to look contradictory because I think yeah. Biden doesn't want to change course at all. Wait, which I I, I yeah, feel like doesn't. yeah I, I feel like at least for me personally I can't speak for like the entire but I'm not I can't even vote I'm 17 but I can't speak for the voter bases. I know that the climate, especially the economic climate, was a lot different during the primaries than it was than it is now. Yeah. So I, I think it, it's okay to step back on a couple things because we have this curveball, this this variable that was not previously considered for when making those decisions or those statements. So I, I think it's okay for, for both candidates to step back on some things they've said. I think for Trump, it's a little different if he steps steps back on a claim that he made like four years ago that he was going to get done like throughout the four years. But like it's different for someone that's in the primaries and now they, they won the primary and now there's a pandemic. I think it's okay to step back on some of those things. But I do agree. I think he's trying not to sound contradictory. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's okay. I just think that the way that maybe voters would take it is, yes, if you add on something to your plan because we have COVID, then that's just like adding on. That's not contradicting yourself per se. But if you go back on something that you say, it seems like, oh, you were short-sighted and you couldn't, and you were trying to make a one-size-fits-all policy, and now you're in the side that doesn't fit, and that's kind of awkward for you, huh? And you have to go back on... Mm-hmm. what you were saying before yeah and i i think this also connects to something that trump was saying that i actually think he did really well on comparatively um was when trump constantly brought up how at least in his evalu, excuse me at least in his evaluation that biden hasn't accomplished anything in 47 years of government and trump has accomplished so much more than him and whether or not you think that's true i think that definitely does well with a lot of voters because a lot of them either one aren't knowledgeable about Biden's past or two in the grand scheme of thing scheme of things it doesn't seem like he's done a lot and i personally understand the complexities of like being one out of a 100 senators and that being a very difficult and 
gradual thing, but it doesn't. It certainly doesn't look good, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that was that really landed well for Trump, and that actually goes along with Biden not wanting to contradict himself on his current policy proposals, because if you contradict yourself on your current policy proposals and you haven't accomplished things in the past, assuming those premises are both true, what do you really have to run on? You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, and and this also sticks true because th- this was one of the most, I- I'm not going to say powerful, because it wasn't like like tear-jerking, like, oh my God, but like one of the, I'm going to say, I'm going to say it, but one of the most powerful moments for me was when he he told Trump, you're debating Joe Biden. You're not like, because he keeps trying to bring it, and, and we saw it in the last debate, uh, in like two debates ago, he he tries to bring in all these other Democrats. Like he 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 blames Democrat governors, de- Democrat like all things Democrat. And then Joe Biden said in the debate, "I am Joe Biden. You are debating Joe Biden. You're not debating these other these other Democrats. Debate me on my policies," which I thought was a really sh- strong point for him because it, it it's he's right. He's not in office right now. He can't he can't do anything. He. He is Joe Biden. He's not Cuomo. He's not AOC. He's not, Bur- you know, like I, I, I thought it was a really, really strong moment for, for so, Biden. So I agree partly. So I agree on some things. I don't know if it was, was it this debate where he was like, you're going to get rid of private health care. And he's and Joe was like, you're thinking of Bernie Sanders, not me. I, I think that I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, if that was this debate, then and then so on some other things. There were some things that were like, clearly, this is literally not what I'm proposing. But I think when it comes to some other things, I don't know. I think in, in some aspects, it, do, it does make Biden look kind of weak because it's like you have the comparison of someone who's currently leading versus someone who's completely sitting on the sidelines. And as for the notion that he's not in elected office anymore, I agree. You're right about that. But also you saw, for example, during the primaries, uh, you saw that Obama was in was like made calls to Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar, convincing them to drop out so Biden would win on Super Tuesday. So, like based off of that, um, we can tell that there are people who are not in elected office who still have influence on politics. So, in the same way, I don't know why. I mean, you can make an argument for why it's unethical, maybe, but I don't I don't see why Biden couldn't have had more of an influence because he definitely was pretty much just absent for a few months there. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that, the that, pandemic. But that, I definitely that, agree that, that you can't blame Biden for what other Democrats do. But I think it also kind of shows a lack of leadership. And that's kind of what comes off in some instances. No, I, I, I do agree with that with that statement. I think. I think we do have to give him some leeway for the Democrats that have had a quote unquote bad response to COVID. Mm-hmm. Although, although he wasn't present, he, he wasn't necessarily like advocating. Like he wasn't like Cuomo is doing a perfect job. You know, like I, I, I just don't think it's a very strong argument for Trump to use personally. I agree. Yeah. I mean, there's some consideration I th- I think- of like what we at, what, Trump's role is as the leader of the Republican like how many people are really watching their US their debate for like US House right like a lot of people are just watching the presidential debate and are mm-hmm. interested in presidential stuff so it's also kind of in so I agree that's probably unfair but it makes political sense as probably incumbent on the representative of yeah. the Republican or Democratic Party to make points about how Republicans or Democrats in general are doing yeah, and, and, I, and I was going to say that, no offense to Americans, but a lot of them aren't very educated when it comes to politics. And, like, this isn't, like, just me, like, saying saying this, like, subjectively. That, like, there's objective evidence that says that we are not politically, like, literate. So for Trump to make these statements, I do think it appeals to maybe some more moderate uh, Republicans that don't necessarily that they're not necessarily like active in politics, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, um, I agree with that. yeah. Okay. So I'd like to move on to my favorite moment of the debate. When president Donald Trump said that he's done the most for black, um, Americans ever 
with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln. Wow. That's yeah, a... That was a that, shocking moment. That's a really, like, strong statement to make. To say that the, the person who freed the slaves, to say that he is a possible exception for, for doing more for black Americans, that's ballsy. That, that is ballsy, to say the least. And then Biden, I think Trump also then said, I'm the least racist person in the room. Where then Biden counteracts that by saying, I think he said, like, you're the most racist, racist person in the room. But, um, and then you brought up to me earlier before we, uh, or earlier you said that, d- did he say that he's done more than anybody since? It, like, possibly since Abraham Lincoln? I said, not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody done what I've done for the black community. Wow. That's also, oh, yeah. a, that's also a really ballsy statement. Yeah. So my, my big kind of question mark there was, what is he, who is he trying to appeal to? And I think this goes on both sides of the aisle. So I, it, my question is, so what I'm wondering is like, who is Biden trying to appeal to? when he talks about systemic racism and like the talk and racial injustice, because let's be, let's be frank. Like most black voters are already voting for Biden. Right. Oh yeah. No, historic, historically, I think it's black Americans vote 80% Democrat. Yeah. So it, 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 89%. It's, it's not a demographic that Republicans can really win historically. Yeah. So yeah, keep going. It's kind of the question of, who is Biden appealing to? Is he appealing to, and, and in my view, he's appealing to people who think that Trump are race, who think that Trump is racist, but are maybe on the fence about whether or not they want to vote for him because of abortion taxes, etc. So, like, usually the the stereotype is like suburban white women, and then the question is also for Trump: Who is he trying to appeal to? Is he genuinely? trying to appeal to black voters with the whole um, walk away movement, I think it's called, or is he trying to appeal uh, and blex it? Or is he trying to also appeal to the exact same people who think he's racist and he's trying to give them either a reason to change their mind or a permission structure so that they'll be plausibly able to say, oh, well, he's not racist because of this reason, even if they don't really believe it. So that's kind of my thought. Yeah. So do you think the Republican Party, like the establishment Republican Party and Donald Trump have a long-term goal for of, getting of, of, of winning the black? Um, I mean, we saw it in the RNC. They, they kind of, d- during the RNC, they kind of tried to win the black, which I just don't think is achievable. Do you Whether, think- whether do you think it's that they're trying to win the black vote or is it do you think they're trying to win the white guilt vote? I, I, I would say it's that they're, they're trying to look on the outside. They're trying to look like they're appealing to the black voter basis when they are actually appealing to, like you said, the, the white guilt. Because I wh- whether you think Trump is racist or not, it's not an achievable vote for him to win uh, j- historically. and and. I'm pretty sure polling, we already have black Americans voting for Biden like, exponentially more than, than Trump. But I, I just want to get back to the statement he made. Yeah. Since, yeah. since Lincoln, I mean, one name comes to mind. I don't know, Martin Luther King, maybe? I, Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks? I, yeah. Just no, I, I, just, just, and I can, I can probably name more. I'm not saying I'm not saying that Trump is or isn't racist right now. All I'm saying is that statement saying that he's done more for the black community than anybody since possibly since Lincoln. Cuz he did say possibly. So there is I think he just has a superiority complex. Well, I mean, which he obviously does. But with the with the the key word is possibly he made sure that he said, with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln, that the man who freed the slaves is a possible exception. It's so polite and thoughtful of him. Oh, so polite and thoughtful. I, 
and then and then Biden ended up making yeah, and then Biden ended up making a joke, and then I don't think Trump realized it was a joke. Um, I need to get to what he actually said here. I need to find it. Biden um, was like, and Abraham Lincoln over here is the most yeah. president we've ever had, or something like that. And then, and then, and then I think yeah. Trump said, like, why are we bringing up Abraham Lincoln? And it, it, and I, got, I don't, it was awkward. It was, it was, it was, yeah. it was awkward to say the least. But yeah. um, but yeah, that that was just like the big wow moment for me. It's kind of it's kind of weird too, right? Like, I mean, obviously, one of the things that a lot of people don't like about Trump is his bombastic personality and statements that are obviously like over exaggerated or just flat oh, out to, yeah, o- over exaggerated. Yeah. One to get a response, and two to kind of build up this hysteria around his, his voter basis. Because when he makes these like big outlandish claims, he's gonna gain like. It, it just it gains traction when people make these claims like someone that is like a moderate like like Biden is doesn't have that same traction that that Trump does because he doesn't make these outlandish claims. Mm-hmm. So but it's also kind of weird, right? Like, isn't it kind of anti conservative and anti what the Republican Party has been standing for in the past to make such bold claims as to say that you're like a better president than Teddy Roosevelt or Ronald yeah. Reagan or any of the other people that they admire that Republicans admire so much. It's just, yeah. it's just a statement that seems to spit in the face of your forefathers. And I don't know how people aren't annoyed at that, that are Republican. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, Biden ended up saying like, you're actually one of the most racist people in America right now, basically is what he was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that, that was a really fun little, a little moment. Um, oh yeah, uh, he said, "Miss, uh, I didn't say I'm Abraham Lincoln. I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody done what I've done for the black community." He said possibly, but um, and then they ended up bringing Biden's crime bill. We can talk about that for a little bit too. Is Biden's crime bill because Biden? We uh, everyone can agree that the crime bill it was no bueno, but Biden has actively tried to reverse what he did. Like he he's he's trying to say like oh I should have never supported it like every single senator supported that bill like there was no one else that like refused it but um do you think it's fair to bring up the crime bill? So I just want to clarify something that there were a few votes against the crime bill. It was like four or six people. One of them was yeah. Jeff Feingold, the like progressive uh-huh. Democrat. Um. But is it fair to bring up the crime bill? I think it's absolutely fair to bring up the crime bill. Um, when it comes to did other people make the same mistake? Yeah, but that doesn't. I don't think that really excuses someone from what they did. Oh, and, I, I, I agree. I, yeah. I'm just saying th- this is kind of the tactic that Biden was trying to take. Is that like he was he made a mistake, but so did a bunch of other people. Like, yeah. I just think the thing that I find dishonest about it is, yes, he said he's regretted it, but he doesn't seem to full-throatedly regret his role that he played in it. Because mm-hmm. he says, and I and I agree to a certain mix. It's it's a it's a t- it's a tricky subject, right? So we can probably say that it was a net negative, right? But yeah. I also say that some of the things that Biden introduced. So the Sex Offender Registry and the Violence Against Women Act were just undoubtedly good things by almost yeah. any political ideologies metric. And then the thing we get into there, the conversation we get into there, what is, was it that Biden opposed a lot of the more strict provisions and he wanted to pass it to get the other things he that, that were in that he thought were a net good or that he thought wouldn't have been able to get passed otherwise? Or the bill was going to get passed anyway. Excuse me. But the bill was going to get passed anyway. So why not put things in that will do well and make positive change? Or was it a question of... Because I don't think that's true. Like, if you just look at the speeches he gave, he was one of the ones who... He says, I didn't put in place mandatory minimums in the 94 crime bill. Which I'm pretty sure is true. But he put in mandatory minimums in one of the 1980s crime bills that he was also an author on. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think I think a lot of people like I think a lot of liberals and people on the left are just 
they're just not giving him enough criticism for his role that he played in it. Um, yeah, and, and I think what people need to realize is it's okay to criticize your candidate. Like, I think it's actually, it's healthy to criticize your candidate. Like, to know the criticisms of your candidate, I, that's, I think that's one of the best things you can do as a voter. But um, I, I would agree. I don't think people on the left are giving him enough criticism of the yeah. crime bill. And, and, then, also, and then the right's kind of abusing the crime bill. That they but, uh, probably don't actually care about that much, like, yeah. let's be honest. But <laughs> because the Republicans criticized the Democrats for, not, for having too many rehabilitation programs in the crime bill. That was their, the main reason they voted against it or had opposition to it at first. Mm-hmm. So yeah. this is a bipartisan, horrible thing. But I think another thing is, so I think probably his best response is the response that he gave at the town at his town hall. If you saw that, which he was basically like, he explained fully what he what aspects of the crime bill he supported and didn't support. And even though I think that's kind of BS, as I kind of went over earlier, I think that's a solid response and gives yeah. people who and gives like liberals who know the crime bill was wrong and ouch to like have an explanation ready. So I think that's probably the best thing he can do. But I also think, and I also think it's probably better to say, well, I'm going to try to fix some of these things going forward. But I like, I kind of have to agree with what Trump said. Like he, he said, yeah, you're saying you're going to make all these changes, but you haven't. And I'm not saying that it's super easy to make changes in Washington. It definitely isn't. I'm not saying there wasn't opposition, but it's not as if Biden has wanted to decriminalize drugs since the nineties. And he's been fighting for that. Yeah ever since it's mostly been a more recent affair Mm -hmm. and i think that's that was definitely a weak spot for biden a lot of the time which trump brought up over and over again which is why i thought it was such a close debate was you have these plans but you aren't haven't actually implemented them or even gotten close to implementing them and however fair that is i think it's a strong line of attack it's kind of like it's kind of like a flip-flop we have trump attacking Biden for having the plans, but not having, I'm not going to say experience, because of course he's had the experience, but having the experience of actually having his plans go through. And then we kind of have Biden attacking Trump for not having plans, but um, mm-hmm. continuing to, to push things. So uh, I think it's, it's a cool little flip-flop that we're seeing. But um, do you want to give a little uh, wrap-up of your thoughts of the debate before we sign off? Um. Yeah, I mean, overall, I just don't think this swayed anyone really that far. I didn't, I am particularly, I am personally a Biden supporter, as you can probably tell by my name and how I talk about this. <laughs> and this didn't really make me want to vote for Biden more. Um, and it didn't, didn't, nothing about that Trump said really annoyed me that much in particular. So I think this debate was just um, kind of a wash. And if it has any effects, we're going to see it in a few weeks. Yeah. Um, we've already had a bunch of votes come in, so, um, hopefully we have a bigger voter turnout this year. That's one of the, that was one of the problems with the last election, but, um, but yeah, thanks for joining us this week, Chris. It was great talking to you this week. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on that bell notification to stay updated on the latest episodes. If you're, if you're listening on Apple Music, give us a five-star rating, give us a review. We read all of them. And just a reminder, you can also find the podcast on Spotify. See you all next week and goodbye, everybody. Behind the Politics is a Vermin production. I'm your producer and editor, Alan Yao. Ben Krause is your host, and Chris Gooding is this week's special guest. The original music is by Tane Dry, and we hope you enjoy this week's shorter episode. And make sure you check out the weekly briefing on our Instagram, at Watch Until next time, everybody, goodbye.